The Roman Emperor Nero. What is the first thing that comes to mind? An extravagant, decadent, and corrupt Roman Emperor who, like Caligula, engaged in debauchery and drunken parties? Or perhaps a tyrannical leader who was willing to do anything, even killing his mother, his wife, and mentor to get what he wanted? Or what about the relentless, sadistic, and cruel persecutor of Christians? There is no doubt that many peoples, particularly the elite in Rome who later controlled the narrative and history books about his reign, loathed them for his perceived vices and crimes. Roman historians such as Tacitus and Suetonius, and Christian authors such as Tertullian, have repeatedly railed against him. But what about the other peoples in the empire? One would think that the Jews, a people who long troubled the Romans, would have detested Nero. After all, after a rebellion against a Nero-appointed corrupt governor of Judea, Nero sent the ruthless general Vespasian to crush the rebellion, who robbed and desecrated the temple and left Jerusalem in ruins. And yet, however, Jewish traditions do not paint Nero in a wholly negative light. In fact, many of their texts are inconsistent in their judgment on him and are highly complex. One such example of this contradictory feeling towards Nero is in the Sibylline Oracles. The Sibylline Oracles were supposedly a series of uttered prophecies ascribed to the so-called Greek Sibyls, who were divine prophetesses. But the true authors are anonymous in origin and have ex ended up existing as a hodgepodge of Greek, Roman, Jewish, and even Christian texts. The fifth Sibylline Oracle is especially interesting because it produces many prophecies about the Jewish people and the rise and fall of various kingdoms, but it exists through a non-traditional, pagan media. The fifth Sibylline Oracle is a tremendously dark, apocalyptic text speaking of God's final judgment on the nations and on the Jewish people. In it, Nero is mentioned several times in a paradoxical light. At first, the depictions of him are quite negative and correspond to the histories we already know of Nero. For example, the Sibylline plays into derogatory stereotypes of Nero as an emperor who embraced quote-unquote unmanly Greek and Eastern values and cultures above the Roman ideal, engaging in art, theater, singing, and being cowardly. He is depicted as a shameful mother slayer who is both cruel and pathetic at the same time. The oracle also depicts Nero as destroyer of the sacred temple, even though this occurred technically under the general Vespasian's direction and two years after his death. Yet in those same oracles, the text portrays Nero as some kind of righteous purifier, ridding the land of corruption and the people that made that wickedness possible. In this construct, the previously cowardly Nero who has escaped Rome to the east, Parthia, Rome's greatest enemy, now leads massive armies to bring vengeance and destruction upon the Roman Empire. Nero, now essentially ordained and blessed by God, acts as a divine instrument of retribution for the attack on God's city and temple in Jerusalem. This prophecy makes sense in light of historical depictions of Nero. After all, during his reign, Nero embraced Eastern and Greek culture like arts, theater, sports clothing, and brought them to Rome, and established peace with Rome's greatest enemy, Parthia at Rome's eastern border. Nero's return then would bring about an apocalyptic eschaton, the final event in God's plan, the end of the world. He would be the great destroyer, a tool of God's vengeance. The fifth Sibylline oracle was complex and contradictory in its depiction of Nero, by molding together the Roman memory of an unpopular evil leader with the Jewish memory of the exiled emperor who had avenged God by obliterating his homeland. There are many other instances of the legacy and impact that Nero had on the Jewish consciousness, portrayals that seem much more sympathetic to Nero than the Sibylline oracles. The Roman Jewish author Josephus asserts that Papea, Nero's wife, was a religious woman who persuaded Nero to show mercy to the Jews, implying that she, and thus Nero, may have been Jewish sympathizers. And the Talmud, an important text for Jewish religious law and theology, depicts Nero as a convert to Judaism. Hollywood and modern depictions of Nero tend to showcase him as a one-dimensional epitome of true evil. But Nero was no antichrist. He was, like everyone else, a human being. And all humans are messy and complex with contradictions and idiosyncrasies. Many have vilified him, especially in his Christian tradition and by historians in the Roman dynasty after him, whether rightly or wrongly. But as we have seen, his less negative, though highly complex, feeling amongst the Jews and other Eastern peoples is generally ignored by both Nero's contemporaries and modern history books. Ultimately, it's fascinating to have a perspective, the Jewish one, 
which seems to give a much more nuanced portrait of Nero's legacy.